So how do you back up your stuff? Well, uh, Backblaze is here with 180 terabytes, I think, is right, on my desk <laughs> to show what's powering their uh, $5 a month unlimited backup service. And we'll talk about that and how it competes even with Rackspace on, uh, right now. Hey Robert, I'm Gleb Budman. I'm co-founder and CEO of Backblaze and started out doing mechanical engineering, did some uh, uh, robotics and then did business school in a, in a couple startups. This is the third one I'm working on. Yeah, and so I've, I've heard a lot of good things about Backblaze, so I wanted to have you in. What, what is Backblaze, just to start out the conversation? So the, what we actually provide as a service is a $5 a month totally unlimited online backup service for laptops and desktops and that's for consumers and for businesses and we build that on what we believe might be the world's lowest cost cloud storage system uh, out there and it, and you brought this box which doesn't really make me think of cloud so do you have your own data centers with a bunch of these boxes in it or this, or, this doesn't look like a fluffy nice cloud <laughs> with rain coming out of it <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if people can see this I'm mean, here on let me uh, show it off yeah, so yeah. this is a 180 terabyte storage server uh, that we designed. When we initially started, we said the service we want to provide is $5 a month totally unlimited. How do we do that? And at the time, there was no cost efficient way to pull that off. Yeah. And so we ended up designing our own servers from the ground up, and that's what these are. Um, and yes, we have uh, coming up on a thousand of these boxes um, in our data centers. And there are up front here, there are 45 hard drives in a normal box. Yep. You can see the slots for each of the drives. Yep. And in the back, back here, there, uh, this is where the computing power um, resides. Yep. And so each one of these is a completely standalone server unit that can store 180 terabytes um, per box. So this is the hardware part of the cloud. Obviously, there's a tremendous amount of software uh, on the back end that's required to turn this into a service for, for ourselves to provide storage. So you're competing with a whole bunch. Of, there's a whole bunch of backup service providers that are competing in this work, you know, you, including Rackspace. I think we have Jungle Disk that is sort of in this space. What makes you different other than you have a cute red box? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. So in general, we are one of the only ones who provide completely unlimited amount of data. So unlimited file size, unlimited file type, unlimited bandwidth, we'll back up all your external hard drives, all for that $5 a month price point. So we're one of the only ones that will do that. And then from an ease of use perspective, we actually flipped the entire model. Every single solitary online backup service since the beginning of time has always gone the same direction. They ask, what do you want to back up? Which files and folders? And it's up to you to figure that out and remember and find them and, and get it set up correctly. And we kind of, at the beginning, we asked people like, what's hard? Why aren't you backing up? And they said, oh, I just, I got confused getting all of it set up or I need to organize all my data on my computer first. Yeah and then I can get backup set up on it. And yeah. so we said, you know. Which is hard in of itself. Cause I know Rocky and I both have hundreds of, or dozens of uh, hard drives. And just getting yeah. them organized and going through and remembering it, what was on his hard what's drive. What's on where and which ones are. years ago. Yeah. yeah. So this is what we found. And so people don't back up and then they lose data. Yeah. And so we flipped that whole model. The entire experience with Backblaze is you visit backblaze.com, you enter an email address, a password, and you click download. That's it, you're done, you're, all your data is backed up for life for five bucks a month. Um, so instead of picking and choosing, it works a little bit more like Time Machine works on the Mac, where it flips the model and backs up everything. So the, the ease of use and the totally unlimited for five bucks a month are the two primary differences. So does it look into my Mac, Mac for uh, like uh, files that should be backed up, you know, like uh, spreadsheets and uh, photo files and stuff like that, or does it just back up every damn file on your Mac, which is a little bit of a waste of a network bandwidth, right? You know, so originally we were thinking of trying to guess at what to back up. You know, we said, well, well can, we know the major photo types and the major movie types and the major doc types, and we can guess at those. What we found, though, was the problem was there are so many random file types that you that it's it's hard to know all of them, and if we don't know them and you don't know them, 
you're going to lose data. Yep. So instead, we flip that model. We exclude your OS, which you'll get whenever you get a new laptop, and we exclude the applications, which can just be reinstalled. But if it's not your OS and it's not your apps, everything else gets backed up, period. And it wastes a tiny bit of extra bandwidth, mm -hmm. but you know the majority of your stuff is photos and movies and music, and the stuff that doesn't fall into photos, music, moving docs, and everything you care about, your OS and your apps, the remaining is a tiny sliver, but it's a way of making sure that it's really easy to get it backed up, yeah. and that all your data actually does get backed up. Now, a lot of us are into photography or video, so we get back home and uh, might have uh, hundreds of gigabytes of new data <laughs> yeah. show up. Does it, uh, I assume if it tried to back that up uh, while I'm trying to work and use the internet, maybe upload a YouTube video, all of a sudden my network's uh, maxed out, right? Uh, do, you, do you get smart about uploading when I'm not using the network or? We try to be smart about using your network. And so the first thing, which you obviously know, some people don't, is there's upload and download bandwidth. And so we are only using the upload bandwidth. For people who are, uh, most of the stuff most people do is download. You know, if you're watching YouTube or checking email or anything like that. Yeah. Um, to the extent that you're uploading a video yourself, um, we do various things. One is we measure your bandwidth and then we back off from that a little bit to leave you space. So we do that by default and we're constantly checking it as we're doing it. Um, you can also just boink a button on, on, in our product and say, pause for two hours. Or you can say, I only want you backing up during these hours. So we have some of those smarts in the system. 90% of people leave it as is, never touch it. It just runs in the background and does its thing. Yeah. But for people who come back with 100 gigs of data and you're uploading YouTube videos at the same time, you can say, hey, hold on, let me do my thing first and then you do the backup. With mobile phones, we have a new problem that uh, you leave the phone in a cab, you get it maybe even ripped off, you know, because people get mugged here in San Francisco now because these phone you're carrying around $700 terrible, in, yeah. in your phone. <clears throat> Do you help uh, back up uh, the phones as well? The phones we back up only if you're plugging them into your computer. So if okay. you let it sync to your computer, we'll back up all that data as part of your computer backup, all included. We don't back up the phones directly from the app on the phone. But what we do have is an app on the phone where you can just click on the app and see all the computers that you have backed up, all the external hard drives, and be able to grab any file you want. So yeah. without having to think about anything, you know, you were saying you have 12 hard drives sitting around. Um, even if those hard drives are all unplugged and turned off and your computer is here and you're somewhere, you can go, oh, I want that one photo off of that one hard drive and just grab it on your phone from wherever you are. Wow. So that, that really gives me some motivation to uh, connect a drive and upload it every night or something like that. So after a month, I'll have all those yeah. hard drives <laughs> uploaded. Um, what else do I need to know about that? Uh, uh, does your service have an API? Can developers use it as a storage device uh, for, for, store, uh, you know, for maybe an app or something like that? We just, we don't have an API. It's, it, the service we provide is this $5 unlimited service. That's mm -hmm. the backup service, that's it. Um, it is built on this very cost efficient cloud storage system and we get asked periodically about just getting access to the raw cloud storage. It's not something we've done at this point. Um, uh, in terms of other tidbits to know, so when it comes to getting the data back, the, the default way that people get it back is you can download it and you can download one file or you can download all your data from any web browser. You can get it on your phone, but we'll also FedEx you a hard drive with all your data on it um, anywhere in the world for a flat 189 bucks and you keep the drive. Um, or what I love is we'll FedEx you a flash key with up to 128 gigs of data. So you know, on one of these tiny little things, again, anywhere in the world for 99 bucks. Another company just uh, showed me a box that's somewhat like yours and maybe a little bit bigger that has two petabytes of flash storage in it. I, you're using mostly hard drives because yep. it's very uh, low cost. Are you thinking about flash and, and does, would that let you do anything that matters to your customers? You know, it's a good question. It's not something that we intend to do because what, the way we get performance out of our cloud storage is we rack lots and lots of boxes in parallel, every one of which isn't necessarily blazingly fast, but you have a lot of them in parallel and you get performance out of them through the software. 
Um, if you need one box with a massive amount of performance, yes, SSD is a, a good way to go. It's not our particular use case. Yeah. Yeah, and you're not going to run a database on this thing, right? You're, right. You're, this is just for storing files and backing. Exactly. Them. And so the, the, one of the things that we did, which was uh, a little weird and nutty, but you know, be, being part of Rackspace, you, you probably appreciate it, is we open sourced this hardware design. So after we built it, rather than just keeping it to ourselves, we actually open sourced the whole hardware design. And that this hardware design is now used by all sorts of companies for all sorts of different applications. We don't get anything for that, it, um, but it's, it's a way of giving back a little bit to the community. Yeah. We obviously use a, a lot of open source uh, software. We use Linux, we use mm -hmm. um, we do Tomcat. Too. We, we use uh, open compute and we're open sourcing our ser servers for the same, same reason. Because yep. that way, uh, you know, somebody elsewhere on, in the industry can, can say, oh, you're not really doing it the best way. Here's a, a new way to do it. Yeah. And, uh, say, and this, this world is moving along at a pretty fast rate that new ideas come along all the time. Right? And it's, you know, it's been interesting to see, at first when we open source that we thought, ah, maybe a few people will care, but it, it's been crazy how, I mean, Harvard uses them for medical imagery and um, there's a large ad agency that basically said, we had all this stuff on tape and our, and our designers hated that because it would take a week to get something they needed. And like at the, for under 10 grand for a 180 terabyte box, put everything on, uh, on spinning drives. Um, so it, it's been interesting to see how that, uh, this has kind of taken off on its own independent of our normal $5 a month uh, unlimited backup business. Since you have a thousand of these boxes, uh, that requires some capital. How, how did you guys get capitalized for uh, building this company? <laughs> it, it, was, um, it was funny and weird and strange, um, especially for a capital intensive business. Five of us worked together for years and years and years doing um, several startups that were venture funded and acquired. We then stumbled upon this problem. We said, you know, people aren't backing up data and this is just gonna be a bigger and bigger problem. There's gotta be some way to solve it. So we decided to try to solve the problem. We decided not to raise funding explicitly to start. And so five of us committed to each other, one year, no salary, we were all gonna work on this and we were gonna try to make it work. And initially, we built one of these. And we started signing up customers, and they started paying us some amount of money. And as we started getting cash from customers, we bought a second one. And for the first five years of Backblaze, we completely bootstrapped the company, other than a teeny tiny amount that some angel investors put in. But it was almost entirely bootstrapped based on customers paying $5 a month for the service. Um, Two years ago, we actually raised a $5 million round um, just to try and experiment and grow faster and hire some additional engineers. But the company was profitable uh, based on just the core service. Yeah. Um, but it was, it, was, it was definitely staying lean and it's, it's what caused us to actually design this. I think if we had raised capital on the beginning side, we would have, we would have said, ah, Building our own storage hardware is crazy and too hard. We'll buy it now or we'll use a cloud storage service now and later we'll figure out how to do it and we probably would have never done it if, if we'd raised venture. Interesting. Uh, innovation comes from uh, having lack of resources, right? <laughs> it, it definitely did in this case. You have to think different. <laughs> yes. Well, that's cool. What was the hardest thing of building uh, this box? You know, it, it seems pretty straightforward, but I'm sure that you had some engineering challenges. You know, we thought it would be really straightforward. We actually thought of this stuff all as furniture. You, you put some drives in here and you put uh, your power supply here and a couch over there. It, you just throw it all into a box and it all just works. Um, the first thing that was really hard was how do you attach 45 hard drives to one motherboard. There's no commonly available way to do that. And we tried USB, we tried Firewire, we tried all sorts of ways of doing it and most of them didn't work. And we ended up finding these five drive NAS, consumer NAS boxes, yeah. tearing the card out of them and figuring out a way to attach nine of those cards to one motherboard and then five drives to each of those. So kind of working through all of that process of how to attach 45 drives to a motherboard was the first thing that was very hard. And then the second thing was just, once you put everything together, 
we thought it would all just work, but it actually took a tremendous amount of iteration and testing to actually get it working well, yeah. um, which was a little bit of a surprise, but. Now, uh, if an airplane hits your data center, what happens to my data? Is, is, it, is, it, is there a way to get redundant data to another data center? So, you know, if something really catastrophic goes wrong, my data is still backed up somewhere? You know, it's a good question. So, or does that really matter? Because my data is also at home. You know, exactly. So, so two you, places. you have. We are your offsite backup, and you are our offsite backup, effectively. Um, so, our we have two data centers, but your data is not replicated among the data centers. Um, it is replicated along lots and lots of hard drives, obviously. Um, the so if a hard drive fails here, I, I won't notice it. Yeah, I mean, we have uh, forty thousand ish hard drives. Drives die every day, continuously. We can't lose data because drives die. Um, in fact, we we did a bunch of analysis on drive failure and wrote some blog posts which uh, are fairly entertaining. Um, one is just what is the life cycle across many drives and many years of failure rates across drives, and then specifically by brand and type of drive, which ones fail at what rates. And, and so we published that, the results of that all on our blog. Yeah, um, I would think I remember that. I, you know, years ago, uh, Seagate sponsored Rocky and I, uh, uh -huh. our show. And so we always are interested in that. In that, <laughs> How good are the Seagate drives compared to everybody else? You know? How do they measure up, by the way? You know, the Seagate drives, it depended on drive by drive. Um, so across all the drives, uh, it was the median life looks like about six years, which is actually, I think, uh, incredibly good. You know, that a disk spinning at 7,000 RPM with heads a tiny smidge away from the actual disk and shoved into a little container and running 24 7 reading and writing data constantly to the drive that for six years, 50% of them still work, um, which is mind boggling. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really amazing technology. Um, but we, you know, we looked at the different drives. Um, we saw uh, a little bit of a, a, a bathtub curve, which is at the beginning, drives die more frequently yeah. in roughly the first year, year and a half um, due to various infant mortality stuff. Yeah. Then they kind of, if they survive, then for the next couple of years, they actually do pretty well and, and the failure rates are very low. And then after a few years, they start wearing out and the failure rates increase. So it actually has this kind of bathtub curve um, of failure rate. Yeah. Um, but um, was there one brand that stuck out and stuck out that we should uh, be, be buying for our hard drives? You know, the, the Hitachi drives worked the best with the lowest failure rates in, in our environment. Um, we bought a lot of Hitachis, but they actually aren't the main ones we buy anymore because while they are low uh, failure rate drives, they are more expensive and harder to get. And so at some level, one of the things that people start saying is, oh, well, then you definitely should buy this drive and not that drive. But I'm like, what, these drives are going to die. You can't rely on the fact that you have one drive and this one's a little more reliable. Therefore, you don't need a backup. Like You need a backup on any drive you have, just yeah. like we have backups on all the drives we have. Um, but you know, there's some statistical ratio at which one drive is more, uh, more reliable than So it's a cost curve, really. It's a cost yeah. curve, especially for us, where we have thousands and thousands of drives. We just do math on they're going to last this long, they're going to cost us this much, and, you, and, you, and, and out of the bottom of that spreadsheet comes, you know, this is a good drive to buy. Very cool. Well, thanks for coming in and showing this to me. Uh, where do we get your service? It's backblaze.com, B-A-C-K, blaze.com. Very cool. Thank you so much. Thanks, Robert. Good seeing you.